In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So you should notice the church looks a little different today. We're back in red again after being in green for most of the period since Pentecost, which was the last Sunday we were in red. Today is the last Sunday after Pentecost, and next week we begin a new year, a new season of Advent, and the color will change to blue. This Sunday, the last Sunday after Pentecost, has an informal name in the Episcopal Church as the Feast of Christ the King. And the reason for that is because the collect and all of the uh, readings have to do with the kingship of Christ. And it's how we close out the year every year. Here in year C, when we're reading from the Gospel of Luke, is when the, that kingship of Christ, when we read the Gospel, seems most paradoxical. Because the King of kings and Lord of lords, the ruler of the entire universe, is not seen as kings are usually seen, but hanging on a cross, an instrument of execution between two criminals being mocked and derided after having been beaten and scourged. This is not how we picture kings. Jesus was certainly aware of that. There's a story of when <clears throat> he, when he was, uh, when people were asking him about John the Baptist, and he said, "What did you go out in the desert to see? A reed shaken in the wind, a person in soft clothing?" And he, then he said, "No, people in soft clothing are in palaces." He said, but what did you go to see? And of course he says then, a prophet, yes. But Jesus knew, everybody knew. Kings are the guys that have it good. They, they live in very fancy houses. They wear beautiful clothes. People bow down to them. All of that. But here's the king hanging on a cross with a sign over his head. This is the king of the Jews, and people are laughing at him. Of course, the irony is that he really was. He really was not just the king only of the Jews, but the king of the world, the king of the cosmos, the king of the universe, the incarnation of the creator God. There he was, hanging on a cross. That in itself made it a pretty upside-down world. But Jesus himself, what he did on the cross was as much upside down as well from what we expect of kings. Most people, in fact, not to mention kings, would have been in a pretty would have been very generous after having been beaten and whipped to be nailed to a cross. Most people would not say anything nice about the people who had put him there, but Jesus, first thing he said was, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He probably would not, wouldn't. The other thing about Jesus was, and we see this with the two criminals hung with him, that Jesus was so accepting. You have the story of one of the two criminals on the cross decided to join in with the mocking, mocked Jesus. Are you the Messiah? Well, save yourself and us too. And his compatriot also hanging on the other cross then says, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. When you think about it, the criminal even admitted that he had done some pretty bad things. Because he seemed to think that he probably deserved to die. But aside from trying to delve into his, his psychoanalysis or whatever, most people would have looked at this guy as not worth it. 
He's a criminal. He's done bad things. Let's just string him up and get rid of him. But Jesus, hanging there on the cross himself, accepted him. He says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus would accept the unacceptable. Jesus, what we le- learn from other stories, Jesus would accept everyone. Now, what is going on here, I think, is partially revealed in Jesus' ter- use of the word paradise. Most of us, when we think of paradise, we think of palm trees and a hammock and maybe a pina colada or something, and that's perfect. But the word paradise itself is a Persian word, and it means garden. When Jesus is saying paradise, what he's saying is a restored garden of Eden. The garden where humanity was in perfect relationship with God and each other. That this is what he was doing on the cross, was restoring humanity to what God intended it to be. A humanity that is whole and complete and healed and in perfect relationship with each other and God. He did that on the cross. And he offered it to the thief, the criminal who repented. He's offered it to us as well. To every one of us. That if we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, that this is our destiny as well. We can return to the garden we can be part and are part of a restored humanity. But just like our picture of paradise and Jesus' picture of paradise are a little different, that call to us does come with price. We are called to follow Jesus and also to take him as an example. Jesus said to his disciples, if any would become my Disciple, let him or her take up his or her cross and follow me. He meant that both literally and figuratively, that we should be willing to give everything to be followers of Jesus. St. Paul put it this way, the other day of the year that we read this gospel, which is Palm Sunday, we read this epistle where St. Paul says, have the same mind in yourselves as was in Christ Jesus, with though, who though he was in the form of God, did not take equality with God as something to be grasped, but rather emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and was obedient, obedient even to death on a cross. If we want to have the mind of Christ and to be a follower of Christ, it involves that same self-emptying, It also involves that same ability to forgive and to accept. To reach out God's and grace of love to everyone. Right now, I think those are some of the things that seem to have been in shortest supply. This last year with the elections and various things, we have seen some of the ugliest behavior I have seen in some time. And there's been a spike in it since the election. In Kansas City, there's been a number of occasions of people who are may be seen as others as not worthy being either attacked or vandalized. There was <clears throat> one of the ones that caught our attention was there was a, a Mediterranean restaurant right across the street from UMKC called the Sahara, owned by Muslim owners, and someone broke their window this week. That was the bad news. The good news, I thought, was that a whole bunch of people said, I think we're going to go have lunch there tomorrow. They were swamped the next day of people saying, no, we're not going to stand for this. This is not what Jesus taught us to be. Jesus taught us to accept other people for who they are and to love them, and that is who we're going to be. That, I believe, is where humanity restores, it gets restored. It's not just hearing that Jesus says, I love you and you're acceptable, but by turning around and and following Jesus by loving and accepting others. 
and being ready to give whatever it takes to make sure other people are part of this same humanity who are loved and accepted and part of the, and in God's circle as well. So as we come to the end of this year, remarking and thinking of all that has been and looking forward into a new church calendar year that starts in just a week with Thanksgiving in the middle of it, let us give thanks for a God who loves us and accepts us no matter who we are, who calls us to love and accept others no matter who they are, and who has granted us this salvation, this new start to a renewed and whole humanity, and that we can do our part to share it with others. Amen.